Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who've chosen to join us today, uh, whichever time zone you're in. Welcome to this year's Jack W. Provencia Lecture. I'm Gerald Winslow, as you just heard, and I'm the director of the Center for Christian Bioethics, a center for which Dr. Jack Provencia was the founding director. Many of you knew Dr. Provencia. He was a physician, philosopher, and theologian at Loma Linda University and one of our most influential professors during the latter half of the last century. Each year we have a lecture named for him, provided by a distinguished scholar from uh, other universities who can talk to us about the deeper meanings of medicine, ethics, and religion. This year, our Provence lecturer is Professor Kimball Cornu. Professor Cornu is Assistant Professor of Healthcare Ethics and Assistant Professor of Palliative Medicine at St. Louis University, where he is connected to the Albert Nagy Center for Healthcare Ethics and is also Assistant Professor of Theological Studies. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Vanderbilt University in Molecular Biology, then received a Master of Arts in Religion from Westminster Theological Seminary. He earned his MD from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, went on to a residency at Vanderbilt in internal medicine, the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Then he earned a PhD in theology from the University of Nottingham. Uh, he has been a clinical fellow in hospice and palliative medicine at Vanderbilt University. He's widely published in biomedical ethics and topics related to religion and medicine. His topic today is Medicine Made Strange, Seeing Medicine's Power Through the Lens of Liturgy. We'll have two respondents to Dr. Cornu's lecture, uh, coming from Dr. Grace Wee and Dr. Sigvid Tonstadt, and I'll introduce them after the lecture. But Dr. Cornu, welcome to our uh, Loma Linda University Alumni Postgraduate Convention and to this presentation of the Jack W. Provence Lecture for the year 2021. Welcome and thank you for being willing to do this for us today. Well, Dr. Winslow, thank you for the gracious invitation uh, to speak. Uh, it's a very humbling invitation as we look at the previous Provencia lectures, you know, a distinguished person like yourself, uh, Dr. Winslow, but as well as luminaries within the history of bioethics. Um, so this is a, a large task for me, but I hope that this will be a stimulating lecture and will provide food for thought about our own, um, our own views of medicine, theology, and clinical practice. Um, so I will share my screen now. Sorry, excuse me. Everyone can see that, okay. Well, um, so I wear lots of different hats and one of them is teaching medical ethics to medical mm -hmm. students. How should you teach religion and the medical ethics curriculum? Sure, we can talk about the prohibition of blood transfusions for Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses or the religious objection to brain death for Orthodox Jews or that a Muslim must be buried within 24 hours after death. But are these the only times that religion comes up in medicine? By treating religion only in these in exceptional cases, medicine is assumed to be religiously neutral, natural, and common. In other words, medicine is secular. But is this right? Let me recalibrate our assumptions about medicine and religion by telling a story. When I was a college student, my sister Lillian, a nurse and a faithful Christian, she was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, while she was pregnant with her first child. As with many CLL patients, life went on as normal, taking a watchful waiting approach. She gave birth to a healthy boy. However, her CLL underwent a Richter's transformation, changing into an aggressive lymphoma needing immediate treatment. On the way down from Dallas to Houston to begin chemotherapy, her friends held a prayer meeting. While her friends cried over her, she prayed that God would provide comfort and strength to her friends. She underwent months of chemotherapy, but ultimately needed a bone marrow transplant. She said goodbye to her 20-month-old son for the last time. 
She had a complicated course in the hospital, including liver biopsy and eventual progression to mechanical ventilation due to ARDS. My family asked to speak with the hepatologist who performed the liver biopsy to see if the biopsy could have perhaps contributed to the development of ARDS. But much to our dismay, the hepatologist sent a nurse to deliver the following message, this following message. I won't come down to talk to you. I only deal with the liver. I don't deal with the lungs. To the hepatologist, my sister was nothing more than a liver. He had committed an act of metaphysical violence against her. Unfortunately, she never recovered. She had an episode of mucus plugging in her endotracheal tube, causing hypoxic brain injury. Friends and family from around the country flew to Houston to be at her bedside. During the last week of her life, we rubbed her hands and feet, read scripture to her, and sang hymn hymns over her. That week was one of the most intense times of God's presence for me, mediated largely through these spiritual liturgies. And yet, God was also present when we had to perform medical liturgies. After performing the ritual of the family meeting to decide to withdraw the ventilator, we participated in the liturgy of the ventilator withdrawal. My sister was extubated and died one hour later. God was present in our tears and our cries. The medical liturgy of ventilator withdrawal mediated an ambivalence. On the one hand, God was present throughout the experience while the medicalization of death was apparent on the other. Liturgy suffuses modern medical practice. In this lecture, I wish to show that three practices in modern medicine, anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and physician-assisted suicide are ersatz liturgies, false liturgies of death that parody the Eucharist and perpetuate a biopolitics of medical power. To develop the claim that these routine medical practices are liturgies, I employ two differing yet complementary conceptions of liturgy. James K. A. Smith's concept of cultural liturgies and Giorgio Gombin's notion of Christian liturgy as the paradigm for modernity's conception of effectiveness. I'll apply these dual notions to show how anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and physician-assisted suicide are medical liturgies of death. Finally, I'll end with a brief reflection on how liturgies shape the way we see the world suggesting how the liturgy of the church re-narrates death into a life everlasting. One may ask why I'm using the concept of liturgy to describe medical practice of, practices of death. Why not use the concept of ritual instead? There are three reasons to use liturgy. One, the politics of liturgy. Two, the formational dimension of liturgy. And three, the effectiveness of liturgy. I'll briefly address each one in turn. First, the, po the politics of liturgy. The etymology of liturgy comes from the ancient Greek liturgia, meaning public work, and carries a distinctly political meaning. In classical Greece, liturgy refers to a wide range of services provided to the city or state. For example, Aristotle names procreation as a liturgy because, um, because service to the state is in view. In the Septuagint, liturgy takes on a more cultic sense. The translators of the Septuagint, as a general rule, chose the word liturgio for the Hebrew word to serve in the cultic sense. In this way, liturgia refers to the ministry of the priests at the altar of sacrifice. However, the political dimension is still retained since the cultic service is still public and the eventual church is the heavenly polis. Second, James K.A. Smith has developed the notion of cultural liturgies. It is based on a philosophical anthropology that presumes humans as homo liturgicus. Following an Augustinian framework, he claims that humans are defined by loves as desiring agents and liturgical animals whose primary mode of intending the world is love, which shapes the moral imagination. Our loves and desires are embodied in dispositional habits, which in turn are shaped and directed by material embodied practices. These material practices are pedagogies of desire that shape identity. Such habits and practices are not neutral, for they make humans into particular kinds of persons that aim toward what they love as a vision of the good life. These practices are also communal embedded and embedded in institutions, such that these are liturgical institutions with an aim towards a particular conception of the good life. Because of the way that cultural liturgies are thick practices that form humans towards an ultimate end, liturgies are distinguished from rituals. 
Smith defines liturgies as rituals of ultimate concern, rituals that are formative for identity, that inculcate particular visions of the good life and do so in a way that means to trump other ritual formations. Furthermore, liturgies also have an aesthetic narrative dimension that are inscribed in our bodies through habits and practices. Liturgies are those social practices that capture our imaginations by becoming stories that we tell ourselves in order to live. In this conception, the liturgy of the church is a liturgy because it is a ritual of ultimate concern that shapes the love of the worshiper to desire and to imagine the kingdom of God. However, it's also the case that there are secular liturgies that form our loves through embodied practices and stories, fueled by a competing moral imaginary of the good life that governs our actions. As we'll see shortly, the anatomy lab as the first institutional practice of physician formation is a cultural liturgy with biopolitical import. And third, in a very different conception of liturgy, Giorgio Agamben offers a genealogy of modern duty that traces back to Christian liturgy as the paradigm of effectiveness. Agamben regards the Christian liturgy as the mystery of effectiveness that is the most radical attempt to think a praxis that would be absolutely and wholly effective. For Agamben, the mystery of the liturgy is actually not so mysterious because it is wholly effective. Within Christian liturgy, there are two sides of a polarity between the mystery and the ministry. On the one hand, liturgy is the effective saving act of the sacrament ex opera operato. On the other hand, liturgy is the priest's service to the community. Thus, there's a distinction between the objective effectiveness of the sacramental act and the subject who concretely administers it, both of which define the liturgical practice of the church. Agamben traces the source of this distinction to the third and fourth century controversies over the validity of baptism, such that the moral unworthiness of the priest performing the baptismal act cannot invalidate the effectiveness of the sacrament. Based on this paradigm of the liturgy, the ethical connection between the intention of the subject of the action is separated from the effectiveness of the action. The priest becomes a mere instrument in the effectiveness of the sacrament, epitomized by the perfor performativity of Christ's words that is at the center of the Eucharistic liturgy. In this way, the priest as instrument of uh, sacramental effectiveness becomes the paradigm for modern duty ethics. The moral or physical characteristics of the agent are indifferent to the, to the validity and effectiveness of his or her action. Furthermore, Agamben extends this liturgical paradigm to ontology as well. Christian liturgy as effectiveness transforms the ontology of being into effectiveness. A being that is fully actualized is a being that is wholly effective. In Agamben's liturgical paradigm, a being's moral character bears no importance. He joins Heidegger's ontotheology and critique of technology with the paradigm of Christian liturgy. Agamben roots Heidegger's metaphysics of technology in the ontology of being as effectiveness, such that human beings as fundamentally effective are able to secure dominion over the world through techniques. In short, liturgy as the paradigm of effectiveness is the paradigm of modern technology. Now let us turn to anatomical dissection as a medical ersatz liturgy of death first by looking at a brief history of dissection. In the second century AD, Galen was the great synthesizer of the received medical tradition, championing the practice of anatomical dissection. While he considered anatomy the epistemological foundation for medicine, he praised anatomy's philosophical and theological knowledge. Through technical proficiency, anatomical dissection allows for the elucidation of the teleological functions of the body and subsequently for the understanding of the whole of nature as created by the demiurge. This anatomical knowledge he calls the source of a perfect theology. For Galen, anatomical dissection is a liturgical practice to access divine knowledge. After Galen, the practice of anatomical dissection dies out and is not resurrected until the late 13th century in the Christian Latin West. Around 1300, human dissection became regularly practiced in Northern Italy, inspired by a renewed interest in Galen and other Arabic medical writers. The liturgical dimension of anatomical dissection was not lost on academic anatomists. For example, at the turn of the 16th century, Alexandro Benedetti wrote a book on anatomical dissection with the last chapter entitled, In Praise of Di Dissection. Benedetti saw dissection as a ritual to reveal the hidden secrets of nature 
with the human body as the pinnacle of uh, God, the creator. By knowing the human anatomical dissection revealed knowledge of God. Around this time, the anatomical theater was born, which provided ritual space for the sacred performances of public dissection that leads one to divine knowledge. Following this intertwining of anatomical knowledge and divine knowledge, some subsequent anatomical theaters were housed in chapels, sometimes taking place on formal altars, former altars. In short, anatomical dissection became an anatomical liturgy. In 1543, Vesalius published De Humani Corporis Fabrica, a monumental work that overturned aspects of Galenic anatomy. This signaled an explosion in an anatomical knowledge and dissection with the 16th century regarded as the culture of dissection. The Lutheran reformer Philip Melanchthon discerned the importance of anatomical knowledge for knowledge of the soul. As an Aristotelian, he followed Aristotle's method of indu induction Start inquiry with what is immediately knowable to us and then proceed to what is knowable in the order of nature. Melanchthon saw anatomical knowledge of the body, its parts and its organs as necessary for the inductive reasoning process to know the workings of the soul. Since the soul is the cause of moral action, knowledge of the soul through anatomy reveals knowledge of moral action. Thus, anatomy for Melanchthon is the beginning of moral philosophy. In this way, Melanchthon thought that anatomical knowledge was one of the clearest ways to discern the divine wisdom with God as architect. Because of its supreme importance, Melanchthon required anatomy instruction at the University of Wittenberg for students of medicine, philosophy, and theology. Herein lies Melanchthon's significance. He moved anatomical knowledge out of the anatomy theater and institutionalized it in the theology curriculum. After Melanchthon, anatomical knowledge became divine knowledge. In this brief history of anatomical dissection, we can see how the three liturgical dimensions of the political, the formative, and the effective are manifested. Anatomical dissections were a public affair, taking place in theaters and then in the theology curriculum. Anatomical dissection was viewed as a holy, sacred activity that was formative for the knowledge of God. And finally, anatomical dissection was wholly effective through the instrumentality of the scalpel, the anatomy theater became a sanctuary for its own Eucharist with the broken body of the corpse given for you that gives divine knowledge mediated by the high priest that is the anatomical dissection, dissector and praise of God the creator. And yet something does not sit quite right with this characterization. It is a liturgy, but it is an ersatz liturgy because it does not require the church and does not bring salvation. Our suspicions are confirmed when we look at anatomical dissection in the modern medical school curriculum. Anatomy lab has two chief pedagogical aims. One, constructing the human body as a medical object, and two, forming the body and vision of the trainee. As one of the first courses in medical school, the physician in training becomes a catechumen in the religious practice of modern biomedicine. The dominant discourse in modern medicine is that the body is fundamentally biological and thus reducible to its parts and its mechanisms. Anatomy lab is a ped pedagogical practice to see the body in this partition way and to foster an anatomical vision as part of the medical gaze. The acculturation process in constructing the human body as anatomical object is evidenced by the laboratory practices themselves. The once personalized body that was voluntarily donated to science has become depersonalized and standardized through the embalming and shaving of the body to situate it in the realm of technomedicine. The cadaver becomes a model for anatomy. The anonymous cadaver as object now can be named with anatomical jargon, such as the flexor digiti minimi brevis muscle or the common peroneal nerve. The cadaver can be manipulated and cut, even destroyed. But in this modern context, Knowledge of the body, which is gained through at times violent procedures, such as using the bone saw to open the cranium to study the brain, is no longer granted the nobility of knowledge of God as creator. Instead, in modern technomedicine, knowledge of the body confers technical power over the body, thereby shaping physicians as the new high priests over life and death. This is the unspoken surreptitious formative liturgy of the anatomy lab. However, in the anatomy lab, an explicit double liturgy is performed that shapes the imagination. 
Following the Renaissance tradition of the praise of dissection, the cadaveric body is praised as the ultimate anatomical object that discloses necessary knowledge for the nobility of medicine as the healing art, or so the story goes. In this way, the praise of the cadaver is a liturgy that creates and fosters the community of physicians as an identity forming practice with the telos of healing. This liturgy that praises cadaveric study makes the anatomy lab possible. Anatomists often marvel at the wonders of the anatomical body, which reflexively affirms the value of anatomy instruction that deems the cadaver as necessary. Here, the cadaver as person is downplayed. And yet, the cadaver as person also creeps back into the picture, but only after the completion of the dissection. After the cadaver has been constructed into a medical object and then cut and dismembered over the duration of the anatomy course, the personhood and humanity of the cadaver are retrieved. Since the 1980s, most North American medical schools hold memorial services to remember the anatomical donors that make such anatomical dissection possible. Within anatomy programs, the language of gift, donation, and gift of life is universal as praise to the anatomical donors who gave their bodies in death for the sake of the living. These posthumous acts of charity foster the social fabric of the polis that maintains the community of strangers. What makes anatomical do donation as gift of life possible is the modern social imaginary of liberalism that exalts the autonomy of the sovereign subject and her power to decide over the value of life and death. Anatomical donation is an indiv individual choice made over one's body that is, in a sense, her own property. The modern biopolitical sovereign decides the value or non-value of life. The gift metaphor merely perpetuates the biopolitical scheme. In some, anatomical dissection is a liturgy as a formative, effective, and biopolitical practice. Now let us turn to organ transplantation as another medical ersatz liturgy of death that further intensi intensifies the liturgy as effectiveness and liturgy as biopolitics. While anatomical dissection and organ transplantation share the same techno-medical rationality, their histories differ widely. Whereas human dissection began in ancient Greece and then again in medieval Europe, Organ transplantation was not a possibility until the mid 20th century with the advent of modern medical technologies, CPR, the ICU, and mechanical ventilation. In 1967, Christian Bernard performed the world's first heart transplant, procuring the heart from a young woman who died in a tragic motor vehicle accident. Bernard landed on the cover of Time magazine and became an international celebrity. However, he had critics. For example, a New York Times editorial appeared days after the transplant, commenting that, although this was not the first time a corpse had been cannibalized to aid the living, the symbolic significance of the heart required a major shift in habitual thought patterns. Several other media opinion pieces consistently opposed transplantation. With the growing tide of organ transplantation as a medical miracle, but in the face of increasing uh, public suspicion, transplant surgeons needed a recalibration in ethical and moral understandings of death to take living organs from patients without being charged with killing them. Organ transplantation only became widespread after death could be redefined as brain death. Prior to life-supporting technologies, brain death had never been observed in actual practice because fatal brain damage resulted in cardiopulmonary death. But with mechanical ventilators that allow the lungs to exchange gases and the heart to continue beating, a new medical phenomenon arose, irreversible coma. In 1968, Henry Beecher convened, convened the ad hoc committee of the Harvard Medical School to examine the definition of brain death. Their findings were published in JAMA as a definition of irreversible coma. The committee cited two reasons for the need to define brain death as a new criterion of death. One, to relieve the burden on patients suffering from loss of intellect, on their families, and on hospitals which need beds. And two, for obsolete criteria for the de definition of death can lead to controversy in obtaining organs of, for transplantation. A private earlier draft of the committee's report would seem to suggest an organ transplant agenda. The question before the committee could not simply be to define brain death, this would not advance the cause of organ transplantation since it would not cope with the essential issue of when the surgical team is authorized legally, morally, and medically and removing a vital organ. 
The transplant agenda as the animating force of the committee has been the dominant historical interpretation. The, origin, the origins of brain death and organ transplantation are essentially two sides of the same coin. The 1968 Harvard committee defined brain death as death. Medical knowledge and the ontology of medicine shape reality and broker values. By redefining death as brain death, based on medical grounds, the Harvard committee created a new space between the living and the dead, where death is no longer concerned with meaning, but instead concerned with defining it in instrumentally measurable terms. Death is located at a theoretically exact moment in time and space. Brain death as death has since been ensconced in medical legal practice, normalizing the biopolitical apparatus of organ transplantation. This is the fulfillment of the anatomical vision learned in the anatomy lab, applied to the definition of death. Whereas anatomical dissection is a formative liturgy that shapes physicians into high priests with technical power over the dead body, the intertwining of brain death and organ transplantation confers a new effective biopolitical power to the physician priest to determine when the living body has been changed into a dead body, and then to transfigure the dead body into a gift of life. Not only is the origin, excuse me, not only is the origin of brain death dubious, as it is inextricably bound together with the biopolitical motivation for organ transplantation, the phenomenology of brain death is counterintuitive. Imagine a 25-year-old woman who has suffered massive head trauma after a high-speed motor vehicle accident. Her life is now supported with mechanical ventilation after a, um, to help her breathe. She is functionally a technological biological hybrid. Her body is warm, her heart is beating, her body has color, and her face is peaceful. However, she remains unresponsive even to pain. Further clinical examination of her neurological status indicates that her brainstem is irreversibly damaged, meaning that she'll not be able to sustain basic life-sustaining functions without artificial support, such as breathing. Lurking in the shadows, the organ procurement service has been following the clinical course, seeing that the patient is a potential donor and waiting to talk with the family about organ donation. After performing a series of clinical rituals, including the apnea test, which determines whether the patient will breathe on her own after stopping the ventilator, the physician priest declares the patient dead on brain death criteria. Although a few minutes prior, the patient had been alive and nothing has changed phenomenologically, the family is notified that the patient is dead. Once the patient has been pronounced dead, the physician enacts a liturgy of death as a priest using technomedical words of consecration the dying patient is changed in a wholly effective way into a new political ontology, an entity suspended between life and death, the living cadaver. This patient is now legally dead, but biologically living. And this new entity is used for biopolitical ends, the practice of organ transplantation. This living cadaver who is beyond harm is what Giorgio Agamben calls bare life, which is the life of homo soccer, that is sacred man, who may be killed, and yet not sacrificed. As another ritual in this liturgy of death, the family must now decide on whether to donate her organs. The organ procurement representative who is trained in maximizing the number of organ donations talks with the family and uses the euphemistic language of donation as a gift of life. On the one hand, this is true. An organ donor, an organ donor particularly the 25 year old in our case example, has healthy lungs, heart, kidneys and liver that can be transplanted into several strangers and save their lives. is a way to find meaning in a seemingly senseless tragedy. Yet on the other hand, the gift of life metaphor functions as a sentimental symbolic euphemism that covers up the organized technological violence that's required to procure organs. Before the declaration of brain death, the patient receives end of life care, which entails comfort care only. But after brain death is declared and consent has been given for organ donation, the living cadaver receives even more aggressive treatment to preserve optimal functioning of the organs. On the altar of the operating room table by the hand of the high priest of technomedicine, that is the transplant surgeon, the organs of the living cadaver are transubstantiated from gifts into commodities in a kind of transplantation nominalism. Although the living cadaver is legally dead, she biologically dies after organ removal. In essence, the organ donor dies twice, 
Gift of life is a secularized variant on the Eucharistic, this is my body given for you. Instead of joining in the kingdom of God, this parody of the Eucharist perpetuates the kingdom of man and his autonomy, sovereign decision, and social functioning of the liberal society. This ersatz liturgy of death retains its original semantic range. It is truly a public service to the polis. Organ donation and transplantation is a liturgy in three ways. First, it's a ritual of ultimate concern that is identity forming and points toward a vision of the good life. The gift of life metaphor as seen in the donate life promotions engenders a strong sense of altruism and stokes the imagination to participate in a common morality of self-giving to strangers in need. In her fascinating comparative anthropology of North America and Japan on brain death and organ transplantation, Margaret Locke shows that Japan, despite being equally modern in terms of medical technology, has been historically resistant to re redefining brain death as death and did not adopt the brain death criteria until 1997. Locke notes that unlike the culture of the West, which has a Christian tradition of charity towards strangers, Japanese culture has a self-perceived poorly developed sense of altruism. And yet, despite the Western culture of altruism, organ donation programs discourage building personal relationships between the families of the organ donor and the recipient through anonymity and deliberate ignorance. They must remain anonymous to one another. The gift of life and organ transplantation becomes what has been called the tyranny of the gift such that reciprocal gift exchange is not between the organ donor and the recipient, but rather between the organ recipient and liberal society writ large, thereby engendering a sense of service to the polis. This political dimension is the second sense of organ transplantation as liturgy. Third, organ transplantation is a paradigm of the liturgical effectiveness of medical technology to give life through death. Exchanging and replacing parts of the body makes a new creation, parodying the new creation found in Christ. Such a biopolitical power regime that strives after everlasting life promises its own technomedical eschatology. The symbol of the gift of life metaphor that drives the social imaginary of organ transplantation functions as another technology, but this time as a technology of desire that sustains the cycle of sovereign decision and violent power over nature to have life everlasting. Because medical technology treats nature as a tool in hand to be, to be manipulated and employed in the service of humanity's dominion over nature, technomedical eschatology always falls flat because it remains in imminence and without the ultimate telos that is only fulfilled in the divine life. Religious arguments in the physician-assisted suicide, hereafter PAS debate, are often excluded because they fail to meet the standard of public reason that requires arguing from universally held premises. Yet the so-called religiously neutral arguments affirming PAS already have religious dimensions because they assume a view of the good life, which is radical autonomy and freedom from pain and suffering. We can see the inherent religious dimension of PAS when viewed through the lens of medical ersatz liturgy. It is a biopolitical liturgy that effectively administers the sacrament of pharmacon, which in Greek means both remedy and poison. In this section, I'll sketch the formative, effective, and biopolitical dimensions of PAS as an ersatz liturgy that effectively expands the power of medicine over life and death and constrains freedom at the end of life. The first ersatz liturgical dimension of PAS is the physician-patient relationship that resembles a pastoral relationship of shepherding unto salvation from suffering and protection from an unpeaceful death that is considered harmful. Michel Foucault argues that the modern model of governmentality or the government of men is traced back to pastoral power and spiritual direction culminating in Christianity. Foucault further notes that the modern pastorate is now deployed through medical knowledge, institutions, and practices. He characterizes the model of pastoral power in two important ways. One, pastoral power is beneficent and caring. And two, pastoral power is an individualizing power that directs individual sheep within the flock. For Foucault, the central objective of beneficent pastoral care is the salvation of the flock, 
and PAS, the physician priest provides salvation from suffering and security from the harm of a so-called bad death. The physician priest affects the good death of the patient sheep provided through the sacrament of pharmacon, which is both a remedy and a poison. The ambiguity of the pharmacon reveals the power of this sacrament by the hand of the physician priest to provide the remedy through poisoning. Thus, through pharmacon, there is a purported peaceful death. Yet as the prophet Jeremiah said, they have healed the wound of my people lightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The physician priest also focuses on the individual patient. It has been empirically observed that proponents of PAS want to involve physicians in the legalization of the practice because of the therapeutic effect of the physician-patient relationship. When the physician priest uh, empathizes with the unbearable suffering of the patient's sheep, there can be an alleviating effect of suffering. However, such a therapeutic effect can only be observed when framed in a medically, a radically medicalized dying process. Kevin Yule makes a humanist and liberal case against the legalization of PAS, which he calls the institutionalization of assisted death. He argues that in such an institutionalization, physicians take on a religious role by replacing the priest at the deathbed. Like a priest providing wafers on the tongue of his flock, the physician dispenses the poison remedy as a ritualized action within a bureaucratic guidelines that provides death as a treatment. Furthermore, the physician priest acts as a counselor since the patient could accomplish the suicide herself without outside assistance. The institutionalization of PAS gives priestly biopower to the physicians, not the patients, thereby undermining patient autonomy based on a priestly edifice. Thus the pastoral power of medicine and PAS intensifies the medicalization of dying, thereby increasing medicine's biopolitical power. The second liturgical dimension is that the physician priest becomes an instrumental cause through the administration of the sacrament of pharmacon, which is wholly effective. The physician priest is not a moral agent in this instance, but rather the conduit through which the agent is affected, through, through which the act is affected, with the physician priest functioning as an instrument of death giving grace. Through the administration of the sacrament, there is an effective change. The model described here is the sacramental efficacy of ex opera operato. A high sacramental theology of the Eucharist entails the infusion of grace in the taking of the consecrated bread and wine. This connection between the sacramental causal model and the physician priestess instrumental cause follows the paradigm of Christian liturgy as the model for wholly effective technological praxis. The third dimension of PAS's Irzatz liturgy is a phenomenology of liturgical formation. The legalization of PAS socially normalizes explicitly chosen death at the hands of efficient medicine through the cultivation of habits, practices, and desires oriented toward the good life of radical autonomy over life and death, paradoxically through the medicalization of death. At least five mechanisms work to normalize PAS. First, change of language is central to shaping the social imaginary. The Oregon law is called the Death with Dignity Act and is careful not to call the act suicide. The death certificate cannot name suicide as the cause of death, but rather the terminal dose diagnosis as the cause of death. The Death with Dignity Act thus creates a legal fiction. Second, change of language works to medicalize suicide. As with most practices in medicine, when something is medicalized, whether it be psychiatric illness or pregnancy, the practice functionally becomes amoral. Medicalizing suicide works to amoralize suicide. One could say that assisted suicide becomes transubstantiated by the quasi-church of the biopolitical regime into medical aid in dying. Third, when the, medical, when the medical practice acts as the arbiter of whether a patient is of sound mind or has decision-making capacity, in other words, whether the internal state of the requester is truly autonomous, then medicine becomes what Foucault calls a regime of truth. Consequently, medicine determines what is rational. After legalization and normalization of PAS, medicine ultimately determines that choosing death is rational. 
Fourth, the media and public opinion play a large role in distorting the reasons for PAS as a problem about pain through stories such as Brittany Maynard, thus increasing public sympathy for PAS. However, pain is a minority reason for choosing PAS. According to Oregon survey data, the three main reasons patients choose PAS are loss of autonomy, less able to engage in activities making life enjoyable, and loss of dignity. The positive view of PAS in the court of public opinion manifests the glory and acclamatory dimension of liturgy, as argued by Giorgio Agamben, thereby exalting the quasi-church of the bio biopolitical regime. Fifth, the law and its practices are pedagogical for society, which cultivates a particular view of the good life. Although legalizing PAS is definitely a development within the context of liberalism, much can be learned from the pre-liberal tradition about morality, politics, and law, which maintained that laws have a positive role to play in helping people make themselves moral. One, impl one implication of this moral education view of the law is that it cuts both ways. Moral choices shape the chooser to grow either virtuously or viciously, depending on the morality of the law. As Augustine argues in The City of God, the law is not morally neutral, for it either promotes virtue or facilitates vice. Consequently, vice can be confused for virtue when ensconced in law. With the legalization of PAS, the good life that is offered is radical autonomy over life and death, coupled with the view that death by suicide is a good solution to life problems. Such thinking that is ensconced in law shapes its citizens to consider radical autonomy and death as morally good. In the biopolitical regime of PAS, moral agents are shaped to embrace vice as virtue, which is made possible through the effectiveness of medicalized dying, thereby constraining the freedom of patients. I have sketched how PAS is a medical ersatz liturgy through three dimensions. One, physician priest as pastor, shepherding patients to salvation from suffering. Two, physician priest as instrumental cause of the holy effect of sacrament of pharmacon. And three, the phenomenology of liturgy that works to normalize death as medical treatment through the cultivation of habits, practices, and desires. In our present biopolitical context, legalization of PAS makes the physician a kind of priest of medicalized death of the bureaucratic state apparatus that exercises power over death. Seen through the liturgical lens of the sacrament of pharmacon, PAS works to increase medicine's power over life and death, thereby restricting freedom at the end of life, not exercising it. So let me tell a story from my own medical practice. I was the palliative care physician for a patient we'll call Betty. Betty was in her 60s with known dementia and a recent diagnosis of incurable metastatic cancer and living in a nursing home. At baseline, she could not carry on a conversation, but she could make sounds and gestures to communicate. Betty was admitted into the hospital because she had stopped eating and became less interactive to the point that she would not communicate, although she was awake. She likely had hypoactive delirium in the setting of a urinary tract infection. Although she was treated for infection, she still did not fully recover her ability to communicate prior to the hospitalization she likely established a new baseline. Because she was not eating, I was consulted by the primary medical team to assist with helping the patient and family decide whether a G-tube should be placed. With progressive dementia and the setting of incurable metastatic cancer, Betty's prognosis was likely months to live. The standard medical recommendation for patients like Betty is not to place the G-tube. The real reason why palliative care needed to get involved is because the patient's husband, and also the power of attorney, wanted a G2 placed. The medical team didn't think the husband truly understood the morbidity associated with G2 placement in patients like Betty. Since palliative care specializes in communication and shared decision making, I was consulted to get to know the patient's husband and to help him make the best decision for his wife. From the medical perspective, the best decision is not placing the G-tube and instead comfort feeding by hand. Up to this point, all communication with the husband had been conducted over the phone. To facilitate good communication, my practice is to have a face-to-face -face meeting when making big medical decisions. I met the husband at the patient's bedside. 
In my practice, I try to understand each family member in his context, discerning where he's coming from physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and then figure out what he knows about the patient's medical condition and what that means practically in terms of quality of life, prognosis, and treatment possibilities. The husband was well-to-do, articulate, and intelligent, but he was very closed off with me. I tried asking get to know you kind of questions such as his work, other family members, how he was doing. All my questions were met with short, curt answers and with suspicion of me. He asked, why are you asking me these questions? Why am I really here? I explained his wife's medical condition, discussed the question of the feeding tube and laid out why it wouldn't be recommended. As I was explaining these things to the husband at Betty's bedside, I was referring to Betty in the third person, not the first person. The husband picked up on this. He said angrily with fire in his eyes, who do you think you are? Who are you to talk about my wife like she's not even in the room? Why don't you talk to her instead of about her? At that moment, I knew that I had wronged her. I had committed an act of metaphysical violence. I had reduced Betty to an object of the medical gaze under which she is patient to the categories of medicine. It was precisely through my attempt to help this patient not undergo an unhelpful procedure that I had unwittingly exchanged the Imago Dei for a medical idol. The very thing that I teach my medical trainees not to do, I had done to Betty. Even my own vision can still be jaundiced by the Irzatz liturgy of anatomical dissection to see patients as medical objects reduced to their parts. These Irzatz liturgies of death narrate a story of human autonomy, biopolitical power over life and death, and the sovereign decision to justify euphemized violence. They pre presuppose a time without telos and a flattened ontology of imminence with the world enclosed upon itself while stealing the Eucharist, Eucharistic language of this is my body given for you as an instrument of power. Through the logic of nihilism, out of the nothing of death comes the some, something of life, but ultimately leads back to the nothing of death. Alexander Schmemann calls this communion with death. To overcome the metaphysically violent gaze of medicine, we need a new way to see the world. The Christian Eucharist tells a counter story that nourishes moral vision. In the Eucharist, one sees that nature is not merely a resource to be exploited, but rather creation, which itself is a gift of God, yet fallen because of sin through which death and disease entered the creation. One can taste and see the God made flesh who suffered, died, and rose for his bride, the church. One sees that human finitude is not a thing to overcome, but is the very means by which one participates in divine life. One sees that willing submission, even slavery to the Lordship of Christ is paradoxically the source of freedom to love and serve others without limit. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, there is communion with life. In the sacramental ontology of the Eucharist, there is no distinction between reality and symbolism like we find in anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and PAS. That is, the distinction between the sentimentality of this body given for you and the violent practices for utilitarian ends. These medical ersatz liturgies of death are a kind of liturgical nominalism, since there is an essential disconnect between the reality of the thing and the symbolic meaning. The modern notion of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist it's a misnomer because it presumes that the only real efficacious part of the Eucharist is the consecrated body and blood of Christ, while everything else in the liturgy is not real, but merely symbolic. For Schmemann, the separation between reality and symbol in the 11th century Eucharistic controversy signaled a turn to rationalism in the church that made the efficacious real presence of Christ doctrine a kind of technology of the Eucharist. The real and symbolic dimensions of the Eucharist became mutually exclusive. The real cannot be symbolic, whereas the symbol cannot be the real. This mutually exclusive separation between reality and symbol ultimately led to secularism. Once the Christian understanding of creation as sacramental ontology collapsed, the world ceased to be creation, instead became mere nature, 
which is opposed to the supernatural and devoid of sacramental reality. Consequently, the world became autonomous from God. This Eucharistic division between reality and symbol is what makes Agamben's analysis of liturgy as effectiveness possible, and hence liturgy as the model for technology. By divorcing the real from the symbol, the Eucharist is reduced to two acts of the real, the causal how that changes the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, and the when that the change occurs. In this way, the Eucharist is reduced to a consecratory formula that is both necessary and sufficient for the efficacy of the sacrament. The Eucharist becomes a wholly effective technology that then becomes the model for the uh, medical liturgies of anatomical dissection, organ transpl transplantation, and PAS. In contrast, Schmemann offers a full-blooded sacramental ontology whereby the symbols in the liturgy are also the reality. Both the real and the symbolic dimensions are found in the liturgy of the Eucharist as well as in the cosmic creation, because they are rooted in Christ, the Logos, through whom and for whom all things are made and reconciled. The phenomenology of the liturgy makes for a hyper-realism because it allows us to see the ultimate reality of life and to see more deeply into the reality of the world, which is Christ and the church. If the real and the symbolic are intertwined, then in the liturgy of the Eucharist, the church is the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, the church through the Eucharist enjoys death and resurrection shared in union with Christ the head. And the church where Christ's body is given for you, the gift of life is not tyrannical, but instead is fulfilled in doxology. In this way, church is liturgy because it is a public work that enters the kingdom of God, thereby fulfilling liturgy's political meaning with the church's polis. Populating this heavenly polis are humans who are essentially worshipers, which Schmemann calls homo adorans, fitting nicely with Smith's notion of homo liturgicus. Humans are primarily priests. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, humans as priests enact their ultimate telos, but are further formed into the telos of the divine life. The church is the eschatological body of Christ, the new creation, and the heavenly polis, where death is no more. In conclusion, we need a liturgical turn in medicine. The lens of liturgy can be helpful both as a tool of social, cultural, political analysis of medicine and as a framework for understanding a constructive theology of medicine. Liturgy as an analytical tool can both deconstruct and re-envision medicine. Liturgy can expose everyday medical practices such as anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and PAS as ersatz liturgies and false idols. Seeing medicine liturgically, even in its biopolitical guises, makes possible for seeing medicine in a robust Christological way. Liturgy serves as a natural mediator between medicine and the church and creation, which is a cosmic liturgy. Liturgies are embodied practices that engage the senses and mediate between the divine and the human. Liturgy trains the body and the soul of the participant reorienting her moral imagination, her loves and her desires, thereby changing the way she sees the world. On the one hand, liturgical training can be perverse in the case of the medical gaze that sees the world and human bodies as dead, waiting to be manipulated by human will to power. On the other hand, liturgical training can also be virtuous in the case of a Christological medicine that sees the body, but not merely the body, as the body that already signifies the divine. A Christological medicine needs the liturgy of the church to re reorient our vision to see the world the way God does, that all of creation is made to praise God with humans as priests. Liturgical training in the church can make the spiritually blind to see again, even in medicine, even in my own eyes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Cornu. Um, that was rich in so many ways, informative, provocative, and I must say, um, evocative of some new 
feelings and thoughts in, in me. So we're profoundly grateful for this. Um, and now I'm going to turn to the first of our respondents, Dr. Grace Wee. Dr. Wee is the Associate Director of our Center for Christian Bioethics. She is a pediatric intensivist, actively involved in the care of our uh, children in the hospitals. She's also uh, teaching ethics to medical students. She holds a graduate degree in ethics as well as her medical degree from Loma Linda University. So Dr. Wee, thank you for taking the time to respond today to this interesting lecture uh, from Dr. Cornu. Time is yours now. Thank you so much. Dr. Cornu, thank you so much for your lecture today, really in your thought provoking work. I've quite enjoyed having the privilege of reading your lecture ahead of time, ahead of when you presented it this morning and being able to have some time to sit with these ideas. And I especially appreciated the discussion on brain death and how you presented it through the liturgical lens, um, brain death and organ transplantation. You know, I've approached the subject of brain death both as an ethicist um, and as also as a pediatric intensivist who has cared for patients pre, during, and post transplant, and also for patients who go on to meet criteria for brain death declaration and to care for patients both before they become organ donors and for patients after they've received an organ can be a heavy thing. And when I teach the topic, the medical topic of brain death, I usually include a caveat that learning about this modern conception of death may provoke an existential crisis. And certainly this would be my experience when I began reading more deeply into the topic. And all of this to say is that I would have benefited greatly from viewing organ transplantation and brain death from a liturgical lens. I really loved um, the ideas that you've brought. I want to focus uh, a bit more on liturgy, liturgy as effectiveness. So, you know, as I'm thinking about it, liturgical practice, it's sort of magic, right? It, it's words transforming into action, but usually by reinforcing the system that brings about the actual good. So, for example, in anatomical dissection, modern liberal society exalts the autonomy of the sovereign, so the sovereign subject and her power to decide over the value of life and death. And this is really done because we have formed a social fabric that has rationalized the use of the body apart from what we've used it for traditionally. In the discussion on organ transplantation, modern liberal society wields power not only the value of life and death, but also now the pronouncement and the determination of when life passes over into death. And finally, I love how you concluded the arc with the discussion on how modern liberal society seeks to broaden its reach by actually redefining the values within the experience of existence itself. What is the good life? And I'll agree that these three processes or procedures embedded within our social fabric have effectively subsumed some of the most profound human experiences into the system of medicine with a big M. It brings a whole new meaning to the practice or to the phrase practicing medicine. Indeed, what exactly are we practicing? For those who are deeply spiritual and religious, I'm Christian, who is our practice in service to? Thought provoking indeed, and I again want to thank you for, for your work. I want us to bring us into the clinical world. Um, Dr. Corner, you spoke very movingly about your sister, about one of your patients, Betty. I'd like to speak about Martin. He's a 14 year old boy diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia or AML. And after his diagnosis, he was admitted to the pediatric chemoc ward where he underwent chemotherapy for induction. He was able to go home briefly before coming back into the hospital for the next phase of his treatment. Little did he or his family know that this would be the last time he would sleep in the bed with the new mattress that his parents had just bought him as part of their efforts to aid his recovery. He received his next round of chemotherapy, but quickly developed complications that required transfer to the PICU. He went into multi-system organ failure. And months later, his body came to a kind of resting place, neither deteriorating nor improving, a state that you so aptly described, and I love this, as 
a technological biological hybrid. Dependent on a ventilator, thrice weekly, thrice weekly hemodialysis, TPN supplementation, low dose vasopressors, and an external ventricular drain for cerebral spinal fluid diversion. We thought he was responsive to painful stimuli, but he could not communicate with us in a way that we could understand, not even by very subtle um, muscle movements, motor movements, eye blinks, finger twitches. The distress felt by both family and staff amply illustrates the failure of the liturgies of our modern liberal society, even as it exerts influence over defining the good life, how to define death, and the value of life and death itself. But this experience also illustrates the failure of the liturgies of the church. The anointings, the liberal amounts of prayer that had not thus far provided clarification on value or even definition of life or death. If ever, this was the time that we needed a bridge to bring together the reality and the symbolic. How do we do this? What is our liturgy for bringing these two together? How about a liturgy of ministry? A ministry that has structure, practice, and system, that carries out a Christological gospel and reveals the compassion of Christ. Can a liturgy, a ministry that allows physicians to be trained to walk alongside the patient, in this case, Martin and his family, can we train physicians to walk along in illness? Can we train physicians in a liturgy that mediates between the divine and the human? that can help physicians avoid inflicting metaphysical violence? Can we reframe the role of physician as priest with particular attention paid to the type of liturgy and for whom we practice medicine? I'd love to hear more of your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. We will, we will give uh, Professor Cornu a chance to respond to what Dr. Wee has just said, but first we're going to hear from Professor Sigvid Tonstant. Uh, Professor Tonstant comes to us today from Norway, uh, where he currently lives, his original home and his current home. He is, um, holds his ma uh, medical degree from Loma Linda University. He also has a Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Loma Linda University. He went on to earn his PhD in New Testament Studies from the University of St. Andrews, and he is now a research professor of religion for Loma Linda University, where he specializes in New Testament interpretation. Professor Tonsta, welcome. We want to hear your remarks in response to uh, Professor Cornu. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity and uh, I apologize for <clears throat> the sort of blurring of my screen there. There is some, some problem with the background. Uh, I, I can't do much about it. So let me say it is a privilege and a challenge to respond to Dr. Kimball Corner's paper, Medicine Med Made Strange, Medicine's Power Through the Lens of Liturgy. It is a privilege because of the occasion commemorating Jack Provencia at our institution and today responding to a paper that adds luster to, Provencia, to Dr. Provencia's luminous legacy. It is also daunting because Dr. Cornu gives us a paper that is personal, poignant, bold, and conceptually challenging. The story of his sister's illness and the family's experience at that time certainly got my attention and sort of created a, a, a sense of, I might I almost say a bonding experience. <laughs> The pa his paper links that searing experience to its bold thesis that three practices in moder modern medicine, anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and physician-assisted suicide are ersatz liturgies of death that parody the Eucharist and perpetuate a biopolitics of medical power. That was a quotation. Ersatz is, a, is the term for an inferior substitute, an imitation that fails to deliver. The ersatz in, is in this context not a minor matter, 
It refers to liturgies that are rituals of ultimate concern, again, a quote, rituals that are formative for identity, that inculcate particular visions of the good life, and do so in a way that means to trump other ritual formations, end of quote. Anatomical dissection is exhibit one in this Aristotle's liturgy. Dr. Corner mentions Galen in the second century as an anatomist of note. Dr. Galen was a physician and surgeon residing in Pergamon, one of the seven cities in the book of Revelation. I had to mention that because I'm in biblical studies. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> While Galen's anatomical exploits also had, has a theological framework, the point of origin for the ersatz liturgy that concerns us comes later in the Christian era, beginning in the 13th century. It comes to maturity in a work exceeding Galen's by orders of magnitude in Andreas Vesalius' spectacular work Fabrica, published in 1543. In Dr. Cornu's words, now looking at the consequences of that, the anatomy theater became a sanctuary for its own Eucharist with the broken body of the corpse given for you that gives divine knowledge mediated by the high priest, the anatomical dissector in praise of God, the creator. And yet something does not sit quite right with this characterization, he says. It is a liturgy, but it is an ersatz liturgy because it does not require the church and does not bring salvation. I sense that Dr. Cornu has more regrets over this turn of events than I do. An impression about which I will say more shortly. <clears throat> the main thing at this point is to establish the concept, the Eucharist analogy, and the idea that the physician acts as a priest. His paper colorizes this negatively. Physicians are the new high priest over life and death. They carry out the unspoken surreptitious formative liturgy of the anatomy lab. From the ashes of the dissection lab, we move into the fire of the operating room and the surgeon performing an organ transplant. And finally to the sick room of the patient who asks for medical assistance, assistance to end his or her life. These arenas are linked in the ersatz liturgy from the dissection lab to transplant surgery to physician assisted suicide, a perceived continuum that might itself be open to questioning. Throughout, nevertheless, in the first arena as much as in the last, the physician is executing a formative liturgy. He or she is a high priest or a physician priest, terms that recur over and over in the presentation. These striking formulations reach their peak toward the end of the paper, and I'm quoting. On the altar of the operating table by the hand of the high priest of techno medicine, the transplant surgeon, the organs of the living cadaver are transubstantiated from gifts into commodities in a kind of transplantation nominalism. Although the living cadaver is legally dead, she biologically dies after organ removal. In essence, the organ donor, donor dies twice. Gift of life is a secularized, secularized variant on the Eucharistic, this is my body given for you. Instead of joining in the kingdom of God, this parody of the Eucharist perpetuates the kingdom of man and his autonomy, sovereign decision and social functioning of the liberal society. This ersatz liturgy of death remain, retains its original semantic range. It is a truly a public service to the police. That's the end of quotation. And then in his conclusion, a little further down, he says that liturgy can expose everyday medical practices such as anatomical dissection, organ transplantation, and PAS as ersatz liturgies and false idols. These are quite strong terms. So bold and far-reaching far as these deserve our attention, but they also invite scrutiny. I will focus my scrutiny on exhibit one, anatomical dissection, 
And I will take my point of departure in an inauspicious sentence in Dr. Corner's paper. He says, after Galen, the practice of anatomical dissection dies out and is not resurrected until the late 13th century in the Christian Latin West, end of quote. <clears throat> I don't know how important this observable fact is to Dr. Corner's conceptions, but it is very important in my reflection. The practice of anatomical dissection dies out, he says, not to be res resurrected until more than a thousand years of a civilization increasingly Christian has had its say. Why was this? Why did the practice die out? And what were the consequences? As to the why question, I will answer that the civilization increasingly dominated by real priests, as distinguished from physician priests, lost interest in the body. There was no shortage of the liturgy that was not ersatz by the criteria mentioned above, but the liturgical practice and its underlying theological and anthropological conceptions had little use for the body. In its most extreme formulation, the very learned and very influential origin of Alexandria, whose dates overlap with Galen's, implied that the human body was not part of God's original plan and would eventually disappear. God therefore made the present world and bound the soul to the body as punishment, said Origen. His vision of the future excluded the material world and human bodies. For if all things can exist without bodies, Origen wrote, doubtless, bodily substance will cease to exist when there is no use for it. Other Christian thought leaders were less extreme than Origen, but the separation of the soul from the body and the priority of the soul over the body has been a staple of Christian theology until our time. In an influ uh, and <clears throat> that is also brought out in, in influential texts on the history of medicine like Roy Porter and, uh, and others. So what were the consequences of this outlook? This is the second point in my response. The 13th century, the point at which interest in anatomical dissection is said to revive, or the 14th century, a whole 200 years before I, I, Andreas Vesalius broke, uh, brought the world his findings, is not a bad place to look. Neglect of the body and the earth in the conceptions and liturgy of the church led to stupendous ignorance of the material world. That was the consequence. It might may be a slight exaggeration, but let me say that when the sun of Christian institutional influence was at its zenith, ignorance of the body sunk to its lowest depth. Here is Philip Ziegler's deeply felt assessment of the century that experienced the Black Death, a pandemic far more lethal than the one that currently has us in its grip. I'm quoting, from the tiny patch of fitful light that played within the circle of their comprehension, our forefathers stared aghast into the darkness. Strange shapes were moving, but what they were, they did not know and hardly dare to speculate. Strange sounds were heard, but who could say from where they came? Everything was mysterious, everything potentially dangerous. To stand still might be perilous, to move, fatal. My point is this, the lit liturgy enacted in the church and that inscribed itself on the consciousness of the Christian civilization of the Middle Ages and into the days of the early Renaissance, projected contempt for the body. Its path to salvation happened by way of escape from the body, not its healing. To the extent that this liturgy was the real thing, that it was not an ersatz liturgy, it was itself deeply flawed. The priests enacting this liturgy were in important respects complicit in a liturgy of death that does not compare favorably with the alleged ersatz liturgy 
said to be executed by the false priesthood of the physician priest in the centuries following Andreas Vesalius. An appraisal along this line might conclude that the ersatz liturgy is flawed, I grant that, but it might also be compelled to acknowledge that although it does not bring salvation, the ersatz liturgy, it brings enormous tangible benefits to human existence that the original liturgy failed to deliver. Let the new liturgy fall short. Let it be regarded as an ersatz liturgy if need be, but let us also say in its favor that it happened in response to the sins of omission and sins of commission of the liturgies that preceded it. Only if this is acknowledged as I see it, will it be possible to grant the merits of Dr. Cornu's paradigm. I would be less severe in my judgment on the physician, beginning with Andreas Vesalius or the eminent Dr. Nicholas Tulp in Amsterdam, who performs a dissection in the presence of enraptured students in what may be Rembrandt's most famous painting. I might say that physicians are students of the wonders of the body, not priests performing a liturgy ac akin to the Eucharist. At the very least, I'd like to remove the stigma of this suspicion from the anatomy lab, perhaps a little from the operating room as well. I hope the doctors know that they are merely extending the old creation by some years. They are not delivering a new creation and their eschatology is no match for the eschatology we find in the Bible. Wendell Berry says that the separation of the soul from the body and from the earth is no disease of the fringe, no aberration, but a fracture that runs through the mentality of institutional religion like a geologic fault. This is the pre-Visalian original sin. He sees, no he sees no letting up of this problem, claiming that this rift in the mentality of religion continues to characterize the modern mind no matter how, world, how secular or worldly it becomes. The priests of that era and doctors that we today have referred to as physician priests may in different ways be shareholders in that original sin. If there is a difference between the two, if only for the sake of discussion, I will adjudicate in favor of the physician priest and his or her trade as the lesser sin. Dr. Corner's paper opens the door to big questions that call for a longer conversation than is here possible. I imagine that a longer conversation might iron out and mute apparent differences in my response to his bold paper. I sense an earnest wish on his part not to set up competing points of reference to the one who once said, this is my body given for you. I wish to applaud and to support that endeavor. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dunstad. Thank you to all three of you. We're going to give Dr. Cornu a chance to respond uh, to what you've just said. And you're right, we'll need much more time for this uh, than we will have in this program. I do want to invite those of you who are watching and listening to use the question and answer function or the chat function. Uh, you can participate in this by sending us your comments or questions, and we will do our best to address as many of those as possible. Uh, we will see uh, how much time that allows, but the time is uh, Dr. Cornu's now to respond to what you've just heard. Well, Dr. Wee and Dr. Tonstad, uh, thank you so much for your thoughtful engagement. I'm very uh, appreciative of that you found some benefit um, in the paper and the presentation. Um, and I take uh, your questions very seriously. Um, clearly, I, I am trying to have a whole different way to think about what we do in medicine. Um, and, and I'll just say personally, the way I write about this is I mean, I talk about my sister and my own practice. My work is kind of like therapy for me <laughs> to, to, to work through the uh, seeming um, 
dis discordance, uh, the cognitive dissonance um, about the ideals that we have in practicing medicine and what we seem to experience frequently. Um, so Dr. Wee, um, very sad to hear about Martin. Um, I kind of wanted to cry just hearing the story because I've seen this happen, at least not, I, I don't work in pediatric palliative care because I would probably fall apart, have to take care of patients like Martin too much. Um, but yeah, this almost stasis that Martin experienced um, as this technological biological hybrid. Um, but yeah, I think your question about what are the, what the liturgy of ministry, how could we better be better formed? What kind of practices could we have um, reclaiming or, or owning the mantle of, of the physician being a priest? I, I, I use that language and this is already to address a little bit of Dr. Tonstad, but it's an, it's an ambiguous, almost ambivalent label. Um, in some ways, I don't want physicians to be priests. Um, I want priests to be priests or ministers to be ministers. Um, but functionally in, in our culture, uh, physicians do have that power. Um, you know, a white coat has a lot of different meanings uh, associated with it, that science and medicine can help save us somehow. Uh, and physicians are the high priests of this. Um, but yeah, how can we bring the divine and human together? How can we bring the real and the symbolic together? Um, I intimate, this, this will not directly answer your very good practical question, Dr. Wee, about what can we do? Um, I'm still working on that. Um, but I think really it comes down to how do we see things differently? Um, and how can we see things in a well, Christological way, even see nature in this way? Um, and this takes a lot of self-work, uh, work in our communities so that we don't see nature as just another thing that we can cultivate for human purposes. Um, how do we think about technology a little bit differently? Um, not technology versus nature, but rather using the Eucharist. I mean, bread and wine, these are human artifacts. And yet, whether you think about it symbolically or in a more uh, robust ontological way, but Christ is, he says, this is my body and this is something that humans make. So how do we think about technology in a way that we as humans are already creative um, and are making poesis, you know, poetic kind of beings and how, it, how does that interface with how we understand medical science and medical, medical technology? So I'm not a Luddite by any stretch. I'm to be completely, open. I'm not opposed to organ transplantation. Um, I'm just opposed to the kind of languages, the kinds of uh, uh, social imaginaries that, uh, that override. And um, so I, I'm not at all against medicine. I'm again, I, I practice it. I, I give morphine. I know, um, I know the opioid conversions and I, I will give ketamine if I have to, to relieve a patient's um, suffering. Um, and we need to know mechanisms. So again, I'm not against uh, Good study. So, how do we, how do we take that seriously so that science is a good thing, but not have science uh, mediate the ultimate for us? And so, I think we need to view science as a tool among other tools, medicine as a tool among other tools, so that it's not a totalizing way to see the world. So that I don't fall into another Betty trap, where I'm trying to help Betty, and in the end, I end up hurting Betty. Um, so what are those practices that we, um, that we need? Uh, well, I think naming it, that education is formative. Med medical education is a moral formation. So I, part of what I do is I teach medical ethics and I have an ethics curriculum that I co-direct viewing um, ethics education for these students as formative for how they're gonna see. I give a lecture about the history and ethics of anatomical dissection before they start dissecting the cadaver. Um, I actually tell them it's, a good thing that you're doing bodily dissection and not just virtual dissection because you're touching a body you're learning how to touch a body and when you're touching a patient you know the sense of touch is the one sensation that uh, the organ itself is the mediator unlike sight or hearing aristotle talks about this in de anima so when you touch a body you're actually touched back so this reciprocity in our relationships with patients that is actually a relationship that has a two-way street not a you know I am going to do my unilateral thing um, to objects. I think that's part of the formation. Um, and then 
to when we have to when we can name that, then we can come up with practices to be aware of the ways in which we are either surreptitiously being formed or overtly being formed in another direction. So the, the practical piece of how do you actually roll that out? Um, I think palliative care actually is should be a model for medicine, not just when things are bad, then you bring in the palliative care doctor, but rather the philosophy of palliative care is already animating medical practice. I would turn to Edmund Pellegrino, the one 1989 Pro Provencia speaker that medicine is ultimately about the physician patient relationship with the goal of healing and talking with patients in a right kind of way, seeing them in the right kind of way is already part of this relationship um, rather than already dissecting them when they, when the patient walks into the clinic or when we walk into the ICU. Um, so I think that's where it would begin and whether or not to, we should call ourselves as priests or not, I'm not going to hold that either, either way too, too strongly. Um, so that would just how it would begin. I, there's a whole lot more to say, Dr. Wee, um, and um, I'd have to think more about that. Um, Dr. Tonstad, uh, thank you for your, um, wow, just a rich uh, um, compliment, but also kind of a smackdown as well, um, you know, challenging some of the fundamental, fundamental premises. I welcome that. Um, I, I am not a sentimentalist in the sense of, oh, if we could just go back to pre whatever and we'll be okay. Um, I like having uh, technological conveniences. I like that I can be in my basement and not be freezing to death. Um, I like that there's light. I like that I can put a patient on a ventilator. I mean, just yesterday I was talking about triage protocols uh, during COVID. Um, well, it's, it's only a problem because we have technology. Otherwise they would just die, right? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not against modernity in the, in the sense of its benefits. So I just wanna say that up front. Um, but, uh, but you pointing out why you know, this dissection uh, dying for about a thousand years. Um, I, when I've read a lot of history of medicine, it's really not clear why it dies. Um, I mean, you, Dr. Tonstad, do you wanna suggest it's because you know, the dominant culture um, you know, then it becomes a Christian empire that there is a denigration of the body. I don't know if I would want to go that far. Um, when you think about uh, Council of Ephesus, Council of uh, Chalcedon, um, you know, thinking about the body and the incarnation is is pretty central uh, in the church's thinking. Now, how the actually the practices cash out, you know, that that's a cultural historical point. But I don't think doctrinally the church uh, should necessarily be at fault. Um, I didn't include this in this talk, but uh, some of the elements in this talk, especially the history of dissection, is part of a book that I'm working on um, that looks at dissection as a, as a dissective rationality, that to see, to know a thing is to dissect it to its parts. And I would argue that this is what Nestorius does in trying to understand the person of Christ. He dissects the two natures from one another, makes them completely separate from each other. So this kind of dissective way of approaching the world was, was you could find it in Greek thought. Um, Whereas someone like Cyril of Alexandria and then uh, the Neo-Chalcedonians afterwards and Maximus the Confessor is a deeply embodied importance of the em of embodiment. Because um, if we're just merely bodies and there's nothing about an intelligible realm, but in a Christological setting, the intelligible and the sensible, they intertwine, they interpenetrate with each other. And this is why Christ is in whom all things hold together. Um, now, if there is a point about the church practically being otherworldly and leaving the body behind, you know, that's kind of an empirical point. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily want to, I can't just give examples of how it did or didn't um, work out. Um, but there was also a collapse of the empire um, around 400 AD. And so uh, all the all this uh, learning went to the monasteries. Um, and the Arabic tradition actually was the mediator for a lot of the Greek learning. But Muslim culture, by and large, didn't dissect bodies. Um, they didn't denigrate the body either, um, but they translated into Arabic and Syriac uh, and went back into Latin. So Arabic was the second classical language. Um, but I think in uh, the 11th century is when you have the first Renaissance, you know, the first focus on man pri prior to the Renaissance in the 16th century. So this is where there's a lot of focus on learning um, uh, the, the human nobility. And not surprisingly, this is when you have the school of Salerno in Italy, 
uh, when they started recovering um, and looking at these medical texts of Aristotle, Galen, uh, and then of course Avicenna provides some of his own writing. Um, so I, I don't want to, I, I, I am heavy handed in my critique of these ersatz liturgies, but I think they're ersatz because medicine already um, takes on a totalizing approach to, to reality. Um, now that's a contestable point, but this is why I, can, I hated being a hospitalist for the year. I felt like I was a cog in the machine. Um, if I was uh, the, the nocturnist, I was trying to prevent patients from coming onto my service and they should actually go to the surgical service. Or if it was out during the daytime, I was trying to, uh, to discharge patients. And if I was the, uh, the afternoon swing shift, I was just trying to admit patients, but never to see them again. Um, there was already a dehumanizing uh, dissective uh, procedure uh, to, to medicine at that point. Like all the ideals I walked into medical school with were quickly gone by the time I had started my first semester of medical school. So I think medicine is a noble profession. That's why I still practice it. So, but I use this heavy handed language of ersatz and just kind of naming everyday practices because this is how I see it cashing out culturally. But can we re-see it differently? And this would go back to Dr. Wee's point. How could, what, what kind of liturgy of ministry could we have to see and reconceive um, the practices that we do have. Um, so I fully affirm the benefits of what, of dissection, a, a dissective rationality. My concern is when the dissective rationality becomes totalizing. Um, I've been doing some research on neuroscience and the discourses around neuroscience. To know the brain is to know the self. Well, that's a little bit reductionistic because we're a lot more than our brains. <laughs> um, so if, you, if you're not cognitive or you're not yourself, um, but I think that that there's a rootedness in this dissective rationale. If you can articulate the mechanisms, then you can articulate what it is. And we just know, well, at least as Christians, we can say we there's something not right about that. But I think medicine does have that as a as a, a fundamental premise. Um, and so I think a, a Christian way to see the world would challenge that. Now, what the solution is, you know, I think focusing on embodiment. I mean, I'm interested in philosophers like Merleau-Ponty. Um, this is why I like Maximus, because he's a very incarnational theologian. Um, and the liturgy, because if we see ourselves as ritual beings, liturgical beings, that we're always engaged in embodied practices that are shaping us and forming us. I mean, we're engaged in a virtual conference. <laughs> uh, we don't want this to be a permanent. We just do this, but we much prefer to have embodied practices. But in what ways is these you know, prolonged virtual engagement shaping us? Um, I think that's an empirical question, but I think there's a philosophical basis to it. Um, so this is why I even want to use the category of liturgy, because then it can help us not be so disembodied. So to, to, to push back against the, the liturgy of the church, at least in the early church, didn't care about the body, may, that may or may not be true. Um, but if we say, well, we still have liturgy of the church now, and you know, this is a Protestant thinker, Jamie Smith, saying, yeah, we need liturgy, whereas Catholics have been saying this for, you know, have been saying this forever, right? And Orthodox uh, theologians have been saying this. This is why I cite uh, Alexander Schmemann, um, that there's a logic to liturgy that goes beyond mere logic, or that the logic is embodied. Um, so that's what I want to at least expose. I want to unveil medicine's own logic, that its embodied practices already have a particular assumption about reality, but that we have as Christians have the same kind of way of thinking, because this is anthropologically, this is who we are. Um, this is what we are to be human, is to have um, theoretical thoughts that are cashed out in embodied practices. Um, and that can cut both ways, both analytically and critically, but also constructively and imaginatively. Um, so I'll stop there, but uh, I hope that at least address some of the initial concerns. We have about uh, 20 minutes or maybe just a little less. And I know we could easily spend all of that time having the three of you talk with each other and refine these points. I do wanna make sure that we attend to any questions that come in. And I wanna read one that I'm gonna read it. It's a little bit long, but I'm gonna read it exactly as I have it here and give you a chance to respond uh, first to uh, Dr. Cornu. Uh, and then we'll see if our colleagues want to add anything. Uh, this, is, uh, this comes from uh, someone who's viewing the, the program. One of the arguments, assumptions, talking about your paper, uh, Dr. Cornu, is that public reason has a secular bias and privileges a particular conception of a good life, namely autonomy. 
The proposed normative vision is the Christian conception of the good as expressed in liturgy. This way of construing the alternative suggests two self-consistent worldviews that one ought to have and that one ought to have priority over the other. However, is that the only way to see the situation? As with others like it, the criticism seems to neglect the pluralism of meaning people can make of practices. For instance, one person's reason for using PAS may be completely different from another, not necessarily for the sake of will to power or control over nature. Autonomy may not be the value explicitly or implicitly endorsed, but that is precisely the point of public reason that it acknowledges different conceptions of the good. Does Dr. Cornu's proposal make room for this pluralism of clinical practice? Does thinking about people as inevitably operating within totalizing metaphysical frameworks track ordinary patients' lived experience? Well, that's a long comment and question, but it's rich with uh, some possibilities. Let's see what you want to say back to that. Yes, I, I thank uh, this question uh, or the questioner very, very much. Um, absolutely, of course. Um, I, I don't ever want to end with simplistic uh, conclusions that is a binary. I mean, this is some of the problems with, uh, you know, the way uh, journalism will present a debate. Like there's one side and another side, like this is two party politics and it's just never that simple. I, um, I don't have a good solution to what do we do about public reason, but what I want to point out is, um, a lot of some of the, particularly someone like John Rawls, what public reason entails is there's a seeming bracketing that has to occur about what a religious viewpoint entails. Like if there's a transcendent dimension to a religious viewpoint, we well, have to bracket out the transcendent because not everyone that engages in public reason can, can, um, can, uh, can affirm that transcendence. But if you bracket that out, then what is, what is religious viewpoint anyways? And then to, and then to turn the table, um, is a quote unquote secular viewpoint, is that really neutral? So, so we have to start getting into questions of um, political philosophy. What is the secular, um, and a different thing that I've written, it's not yet out yet, but um, I try to make this case that uh, uh, secular reasoning in a clinical ethics space, if it says you can't bring your own religious viewpoint to the table, um, then what is that doing to the clinical ethicist? Um, because you might as well just have an AI, like a, a robot do the reasoning because they're not gonna have any particular assumptions about what the good life is. They're just going to be taking in information and then spitting out something. Um, but do we want living uh, agents or dead agents? Because an AI is by definition dead. Um, now, what do we do uh, in a larger setting, uh, public discourse about PAS, for example? Well, the California law, is called the End of Life Options Act. Um, calling it an option means death is an option. Um, uh, Martha Minot, she was a, uh, I don't know if she's still at Harvard, but she wrote a piece in a law journal uh, in the wake of uh, the 1997 Supreme Court decision, uh, Vacco v. Quill and uh, Washington v. Glucksburg, ruling that the um, that, uh, right to die is not a constitutionally protected right. Um, Minot's piece basically argues that if you make death an option, it becomes an option that colors all the other options. So you just say, well, it's about choice or, 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 or fear, like fear of something bad happening, like Brittany Maynard. That was some of her reasoning. But it came down to, but it's my choice. The government can tell me what or what I can't do. But if you say, what if you are elderly or you have troubles and you've been given a prognosis of six months or less? Now, if you're in the Netherlands or Belgium, you can take that off the, or Canada for that matter, take those things off the table. It's like, well, you just have unbearable suffering, but we'll just, we'll stick to the US. Well, if you say that the good life entails being able to be independent, doing stuff for yourself, being free of pain, and there's this option to you to take this medication, lethal dose of medication, and you might start wondering, why shouldn't I do it? Um, it's going to relieve the burden from family. Um, I won't have to deal with all this stuff about what's going to happen or when is it going to happen to me? Um, it starts becoming, why shouldn't I choose it? There, there's, there's a, uh, a value, um, that can be attached to the choice itself, even though it's just one choice among many. 
um, but because of the way the logic plays out, um, it, it becomes a much bigger uh, persuasive choice, I would argue. And this is how the cultural uh, cash out works. So I, I completely acknowledge the pluralism uh, of you know, our kind of polity. Um, and how to do it well, I don't have a good answer for that. But what I would want to do is point out that the apparent, uh, a seemingly neutral position isn't really neutral, that there's already assumptions embedded into these kinds of discourses. So that requires a lot much more speaking and researching and, and, um, and writing to debate these kinds of things. But that's where I'd want to begin, is that uh, in a pluralistic setting, uh, a seemingly neutral secular viewpoint is not necessarily neutral. Got a couple of other questions coming in here, but I want to see if uh, either of our respondents want to add anything to what's been said so far. You know, I, I just, I, I want to add that I, I really um, am seeing, I, I think bridging is is a really important use of of our, our liturgies or our practices, right? And so bridging between different pluralities, I think that's where we, I think this is where we would um, see the most, um, or see just some really beautiful use of the of our of liturgy, and whether that be you know how we define the liturgy. Dr. Tonstein, anything uh, more that you want to add in here? Okay, you're going to pass. Let me just read a question that has uh, come in here. Um, are there, or should there be checks and balances against the medicalization and thus amoralization of acts that might otherwise be considered immoral? Um, I'm not sure what all is behind that, but uh, anybody, Dr. Cornu, you want to take that on? Um, I mean, checks and balances, you already need a preconception about um, what the possible abuses could be, but even by talking about medicalization or amoralization of something, well, if, if it's amoral, there's not even a sense that you need checks and balances. You just make, if the procedure is okay, then there's no questions, but there's actually an article uh, that came out in Journal of Medicine Philosophy uh, last month, two months ago, that um, examined uh, the euthanasia practices in Belgium and finding that all the safe, supposed safeguards that were in place just they don't do anything. I mean, there's a review board, but they meet after the, euth uh, the, the euthanasia has occurred. And the number of appeals, I think there's been one <laughs> uh, questionable appeal after being legal since 2002. Um, so we, we, we think that we're doing a really good job if we have good, good legislation, but what kind of checks and balances should there be? I mean, look at Oregon, uh, physicians have um, legal immunity. And so we don't keep track of, well, did the patient really have capacity? Well, it's up to the physician to decide that. And if you look at the number of patients that actually get referred to psychiatry um, for potential mental illness, uh, it is very, very low. It's like less than 1% of patients um, that have gotten referral for that. So should you require physicians to uh, involve psychiatrists? Well, then if physician or uh, psychiatrists that don't agree with the practice, then they're somehow involved now. Um, so Colorado, this was a this was a proposal before it became legal, and this and one of my friends, he's a Catholic, he's he's a psychiatrist. He says no, we don't want psychiatrists to be part of this checks and balances because now we're going to be complicit in this act. Like yes, they have capacity. It's like okay, we've checked that bureaucratic uh, check, and now they can proceed. Um, so are you are you materially cooperating? Uh, with the practice, uh, even though you're morally opposed to it. Um, so I think uh, checks and balances um, assumes that procedure will save the day. Um, but you really have to think through, is this, first of all, a moral action? If you don't think it's a moral action, but in the setting of plurality, well, I, I think uh, the cultural lives of these issues start taking a, a bigger life of their own beyond what you think the legislation will, will protect against. Um, because if death becomes normal, then the checks and balances won't save you. This may be uh, the last topic we'll be able to take up, and it's a kind of an obvious one. Uh, you begin your paper, Dr. Cornu, talking about your role as a, an educator of the next generation of physicians. All three of you uh, 
talking about these matters today are educators. Here's the question, how do these liturgical practices change the way we structure medical school curricula? You've spoken to that a little bit, but if, if and I'll address this to all three of you, if you could be in charge, and, and to some extent you do have a lot of influence over this, um, and could change the, the way physicians are educated, how would the conversation we've had today uh, be reflected in those changes? Um, I know the answer, but I don't know how to fix it. So, <laughs> so for me, um, it's always, at least for medical school, it's, it's the hidden curriculum. It's third and fourth year. It's how, uh, when the medical students are on the wards and they are being trained by their interns, their residents and their attendings and the nurses and the ethos of the, whether you're on surgery and is it malignant or not? Um, versus, you know, touchy-feely, happy-go-lucky kind of family medicine. I mean, if you have a really good, compassionate surgeon attending, then that medical student will be well-formed under their tutelage. Um, so I, that's where I would really put the money. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time, um, like my the ethics curriculum that I've, I've helped um, create, it starts with orientation, telling the students, this is what medicine is, it's a physician patient relationship. It's what is a good physician. It's one that, you know, ultimately talk, we talk about love, you know, care, concern. And then we have these nodes, modular nodes throughout uh, the preclinical years. Um, but how much of that sticks once you've been liturgically formed? Um, like uh, the surgery liturgy of you have to be up at four in the morning pre-rounding and making sure you look at all the dressings. Then you have to make sure you act a certain kind of way. Otherwise, you're going to be, be humiliated. I mean, there was a medical student that I was uh, spending time with, and she uh, got to know a patient on the surgery rotation. She took a day off or something, and then she came back and the patient had died. And it was, a, it was surprising. I mean, the patient was sick, but no one was expecting the patient to die. During, she found out when she came back and then during round, she started crying because she'd grown an attachment to this patient. And the residents, they laughed at her. So I would say that's not only unprofessional and not only is it unethical, but it's lit, liturgically formative in a perverse kind of way. And I would, that's how I'd want to call it out. So I, I think I would want to really try to change the culture of medicine so that care and concern, and, and there's a lot of caring and concerning kind of physicians out there, but the practices of medicine sometimes beat that out of you. I mean, you get burned out. And the, and the solutions to burnout is just do mindfulness or something like that. No, the culture itself is, is the cause. Um, so that's, that's how I would answer your question, Dr. Winslow. I just don't know how to change the culture of medicine except for reading it differently altogether. Let me see if <clears throat> our colleagues want to add anything to that or subtract. I, I, would, I would totally agree. Um, I don't know how you, I think there's, yeah, I, I totally agree. There's been this focus on shaping and moral formation of the person, but much less to the moral and shaping the moral formation of the system. And the moral formation of the system is the, the hidden curriculum that subtly shapes and molds. And yeah, I'm, I'm really sure that, you know, in the case of your student, that the action of the residents laughing and the team laughing at her had a very deep impact on her. But the entire system the training, the surgical environment, and let's not single out surgery by all means. I mean, just the surgical environment, I'm sorry, the medical environment and the system of medicine as a capital M is in itself its own religion, its own system. And until we find ways to bridge, um, I mean, I think it's very easy to, just to retreat to a system that you understand and that is familiar with you, whether it be a religious system or the system of medicine. But really the key, I think, is, is to find these bridges and areas of connection between the two, um, you know, the, the secular and, and, the, and the spiritual really touching in a deep and meaningful way. And what ways do we do this, right? What ways are we able to, to connect the two together?
So. Dr. Tonstad, anything you want to say about that? Well, uh, I'd like to say, since I know the practice in our institution at Loma Linda, I really think highly of the anatomy department. I was so privileged to learn anatomy at Loma Linda. It was like a sacred experience, and 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 I will, and I'm. I think I, I can understand that your ersatz uh, concept, uh, Dr. Corno, is a little maybe sort of a tongue in cheek or something like that, that you have just to say something that that provokes thought. But I did not think it was a ersatz. It, it was supplement. It was really amazing uh, anatomy professors we had. And I still think that our institution has it. The problem is later when you get on the wards that there is cruel and unusual punishment in the way they train doctors, especially in America. And I have seen uh, how one does it in other countries and, and the country I have in mind is Norway. It's possible to train good physicians without sending them on the ward at four in the morning or five in the morning or even six in the morning. That's a, simply an illusion, a delusion in American medicine that it takes that kind of hours to, to do it well. So could I just say one more thing about the problem about the, the church uh, era before, uh, uh, the, before the rebirth of anatomy. I think there is a problem in, in the sort of the history there. When the emperor Justinian, I have read that he, when he, in, in the year 529, he closed the academy in Athens and burnt all the books, including books on natural science that had been were 500 years old, a thousand years old, just erasing insights that somehow the church didn't think it needed anymore. And at the other end, in, when the Ferdinand and Isabella took over uh, the southern Spain, they emptied the library in Granada and burnt 80,000 books in the public square. There is a problem there, but I sense already in our conversation now that our paradigms are really not comp competing. They are more complementary and that we will, in the longer conversation, uh, uh, come to a good, good sort of uh, see very significant common ground. I really, really appreciated your paper and the opportunity to participate here. Thank you. Thank you all. That's an excellent note, I think, to end on. Uh, let me add my thanks, Dr. Cornu, for presenting the paper and to our two respondents. Let me also thank the Loma Linda University Alumni, School of Medicine Alumni Association for allowing us to be part of this program. Um, I want to say to those of you who have watched, um, we will have a recording of the program on our website for the, Christian, the Center for Christian Bioethics, and you'll be um, able to see that in a couple of weeks time. Uh, so once again, thanks to the three of you and Dr. Reichert, we're uh, turning the time back to you. Thank you very much. All of you, Dr. Cornu, Dr. Winslow, Dr. Wee and Dr. Tonstead, it was uh, um, very thought provoking. Uh, so.